Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. 9-11 still killing first responders. We've also got explosive Cold War plots and the latest unbelievable developments in the Taos compound story. But first, never forget, the government said the air was safe. Now thousands of 9-11 first responders have cancer. As Americans prepare for the 17th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, nearly 10,000 first responders and New York City residents have reported 9-11 related cancers. In early August, the New York Post reported on newly released numbers of reported 9-11 related illnesses, including 9,795 total cases of 9-11 related cancer. The numbers were released by the federally funded World Trade Center Health Program. According to that program, there have been more than 400 documented cases of death from 9-11 related cancers. However, unfortunately, the plight of the men and women who rushed into Ground Zero on September 11, 2001 and the following months are often forgotten in the public conversation. 17 years after the attacks, the first responders are all still fighting for their lives. One week after after 9-11, the Environmental Protection Agency's administrator, Christine Todd Whitman, released a statement declaring the air and water surrounding Ground Zero to be safe to breathe and drink. The classic quote, given the scope of the tragedy from last week, I am glad to reassure the people of New York and Washington, D.C. that their air is safe to breathe and their water is safe to drink, end quote. Since that time, firefighters, EMTs, cops, volunteers, all the people who remained at Ground Zero looking for survivors and bodies found themselves falling victim to breathing illnesses, cancer, and other sicknesses likely related to inhaling aerosolized dust consisting of building materials, computers, and quite literally human bodies. James, the sort of political landscape here in the States, as you and I kind of briefly talked about before we started to tape here, is just – pretty in uh, just it's it's intolerable ruckus and and disaster mess all you gotta do is look at what's going on in the news right now i was uh, not too many things shock and surprise me i was kind of shocked and surprised to see former epa administrator then governor of new jersey almost like she kind of got promoted or something on the tweets yesterday on in the now which i think is one of those rt kind of twitter accounts Talking about essentially Trump derangement syndrome. There's a time when you put the country ahead of your party. Former GOP governor Christine Todd Whitman is telling Trump to resign, and I just couldn't stop myself and ask the people all on that thread, are you guys aware of this story where Christine Todd Whitman 17 years ago lied to the public about 9-11 that the air was safe to breathe? James? It is a remarkable story, and for people who don't know the story or don't know the details, I will uh, humbly suggest they check out my 9-11 Suspects uh, video on Christine Todd Whitman talking about that at great length and in great detail. And the long story short is that, yes, the U.S. Uh, government operatives and deep state operatives who were responsible for 9-11 were also responsible for directly lying to the public about the air quality at Ground Zero and are now now have the deaths of hundreds of confirmed cases on their hands. Who knows how many of the people who've died in the last uh, 17 years have not been officially counted on that role. But anyway, we know there's now up to 10,000 people with walking around with cancer, i.e. Three and, a, three and a half times more than the amount of people that actually died on the day of 9-11 itself have died as a result of that lie, that absolute on the record documentable lie. And again, please do go to see that 9-11 Suspects video if you want the documentation on that. Um, there, everyone can agree, no matter what you think about 9-11, everyone can agree that the first responders who were responding to what was happening that day, rushing into buildings, pulling people out, risking their lives, truly are heroes and truly do, do deserve the respect of people whose lives they saved and, and people all around the country. And they are, they are heroes. But the difference is that people in the 9-11 truth movement have always treated them that way, listened to their stories, knew the government lied to them and actively campaigned about this back when the government was still denying it. And uh, most people, again, will give lip service. Oh yeah, the firefighters, the police, oh, they're heroes, but don't really care when they start dropping like flies. So 9-11 uh, truth has been there since the beginning on this issue. And uh, it's, Good to see that there is some coverage of it, but ultimately it's never going to come back down to the fundamental truth that Christine Todd Whitman and, of course, other people in the government directly, knowingly, wittingly lied to these people and the blood of all those dead first responders are on their hands. 
James, since this will pretty much this will suffice for our our 17th anniversary coverage, and I guess all that I would say beyond sort of just even the the uh, the first responders and all that, it's just it's the blank check. It's the blank check that just keeps on giving and giving and giving. Seventeen years later, and what you've even published, you know, recent research showing course, always some sort of catalyzing event that gets us into a war, something to do with Afghanistan. It's seven, 17 years. It's It starts to get unbelievable. Again, these kids are going to be graduating from high school, and it's just going to be some sort of event in the past, and nobody really thinks about it, because now what passes for political discourse is, I don't know, people who used to seem to talk about 9-11 a bunch now want to go run around in D.C. and take part in the big political dog and pony show. James, our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 350. Woo, balloons, confetti. A story actually submitted by our good buddy and video editor, Brock West. Declassified docs reveal how the Pentagon aimed to nuke USSR and China into oblivion. Plans for a nuclear war were devised by the U.S. Army in the 1960s, considered decimating the Soviet Union and China by destroying their industrial potential and wiping out the bulk of their populations, newly declassified documents show. A review of the U.S. General Nuclear War Plan by the Joint Staff in 1964, which was recently published by George Washington University's National Security Archive Project, shows how the Pentagon studied options to destroy the USSR and China as viable societies. The review of the what's called the Single Integrated Operational Plan Plan, or PSYOP, conducted two years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, devises the destruction of the Soviet Union as a viable society by annihilating 70% of its industrial floor space during preemptive and retaliatory nuclear strikes. Similar goals tweaked for China, giving its more agrarian-based economy at the time. According to the plan, the U.S. would wipe out 30 major Chinese cities, killing off 30% of the nation's urban population and having its industrial capabilities destroyed. The successful execution of the large-scale of nuclear assault would ensure that China would no longer be a viable nation. The review reads, we will, of course, include the original research of this that goes to the nsarchive.gwu.edu. U.S. nuclear war plan option sought destruction of China and the Soviet Union as viable societies. James, shocked. I'm sure so it's a good thing you're sitting down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, of course, that's going to be the reaction of a lot of people. Oh, of course, we already knew this. But no, don't l- allow that reaction to take over um, th- these types of stories. Because I, uh, I'd first like to stress for people who don't know, the National Security Archive is a valuable treasure trove of very important and interesting documents on all sorts of these types of subjects. And yeah, it's always, you know, 50 years after the fact, but they are valuable subjects to study and to understand in their in their actual original form, in the actual documents that we now have. Things like Operation Northwoods, things like these nuclear war plans, things like uh, Able Archer and other things that most people don't really know very much about or don't know many details of that are important. It is important to know uh, the details of this because people are familiar with Dr. Strangelove and kind of the the Hollywoodization of this. Um, And maybe some people who listened to my episode 175 on the Rand Corporation Exposed know that Dr. Strangelove was based on a very real Rand researcher called Herman Kahn, who was writing about his doomsday machine um, and, you know, winnable nuclear war and all of this. But it is important to connect these pieces and these dots to know that these plans were in place and that National Security Directive from Carter and then from Reagan were about how, you know, we've got to win a nuclear war. Uh, th- these things are still on the books. Now they've just changed to uh, talking about first strike tactical nuclear uh, ex- exchanges and things like that. Still part of the nuclear doctrine of the United States. It is important to understand this in its historical context so that we understand that we are still living in a world where literally the wrong person on the wrong day with the wrong button, finger on the wrong button, can start nuclear Armageddon. It really is something that can happen, and we have to understand that, especially as we now see the left getting whipped up into their war hysteria over the Ruskies. Oh my god, Russia, we got to obliterate them from the planet. Well, hey, have we got a solution for you guys? So it is important to understand these documents in the historical detail. It's also fascinating for people who are just interested in the historical research, so I hope people will go and check out the links uh, to the actual National Security Archive documents. 
And they do, again, just as always, everything that we mentioned on these shows is always included down in the show notes. And they do have these sort of separate documents that you can download and sort of look, again, at, the, at sort of the actual, the actual documents. James, quick question for you. It didn't ring a bell to me. What is Abel Archer? Oh, uh, you're going to find out next week if you stay tuned to CorbettReport.com. <laughs> Uh, all right okay finally here on the last segment on this new world next week episode james last friday august 31st i was chilling on the porch all the media monarchy shows for the week were all done and i had actually just seen jason burmas who's been doing a bunch of work for we are change he put up a video on the new mexico compound exposed it was a great primer i think on the taos compound story with details that i didn't know when we last covered this story on our previous episode details like phone call recordings with the lead guy telling his mom not to worry that it was all for the cameras Burmese's video actually had all of the updates on the Taos compound story up until all the charges were dropped and they all get set free. And I assumed the story was going to pretty much disappear as it already had started to. And then what do I see on the tweets on Friday on, you know, dumping day? FBI arrests New Mexico compound members on new charges. Five residents of a New Mexico compound were arrested on Friday by the FBI for violating firearms and conspiracy laws in what one of their lawyers described as a bad development for the group who are accused of planning anti-government attacks. James, I basically have just a really interesting set of updates on this story. And again, the previous episode of New World Next Week, we, we go into this Taos compound story. The arrests and charges... These new charges from the FBI came two days after two judges dismissed child abuse charges against the five defendants on procedural grounds and allowed three to be released from jail in Taos. The FBI said it arrested the defendants without incident in Taos. Tom Clark, Ibn Wahaj's lawyer, one of the main guys, said the arrests were not a huge surprise as the FBI had been involved from the beginning. The five were first arrested following an August 3rd raid by the sheriff that found a cache of firearms and 11 kids with no food, clean water. Three days later, they found the body of a missing three-year-old son in a tunnel at the compound. So basically, the FBI scoops all these guys up essentially a day after they all get freed. The five Muslim defendants then made their first appearance in U.S. District Court of New Mexico in Albuquerque. They've now been moved to the big city. So this happened on September 4th, of course, here in the state. September 3rd was Labor Day. So, of course, all government offices and things closed. As you may have noticed, everything ratcheted up into high gear on Tuesday, September 4th. U.S. Magistrate Judge Curtin Kalsa on Tuesday said she would seek additional information from probation officers ahead of making a bail decision in the controversial case. She was due to make that ruling on bail today, but in just the last few hours, the defense asked for a continuation. Preliminary hearing and pre-trial detention got kicked to next Wednesday. Meanwhile, Taos County District Attorney Donald Gallego said in a statement that he planned to refile the charges. That would be the child abuse charges against the three other defendants to a grand jury coming up on September 27th. So then the local Taos district attorney and the state attorney general each get into it. This from news station KOB. A war of words erupted after New Mexico's attorney general criticized the handling of the high-profile case involving the suspects arrested at a northern New Mexico compound. We are not doing our best at bringing justice when it comes to children who are victimized in the state of New Mexico, Attorney General Hector Balderas said, slamming Taos District Attorney Donald Gallegos during an interview with local TV station KOB. Balderas criticized Gallegos for not accepting his help to prosecute the five suspects arrested in connection with the compound and the death of three-year-old Abdul Ghani Wahaj. On Friday, Gallegos fired back via letter to Baldera saying, the biggest untruth you told was that I had declined your offer of assistance. I'm sorry that you're not happy that you were unable to get national press by entering the case in an early point, as that is what you seem to be concerned about, the Taos DA wrote. And the last little update nugget that I can add to this tale, James, FBI says teen from New Mexico compound told them he was trained for jihad. So this is according to the FBI and according to court documents, they said he was training to conduct jihad against non-believers. So put quite simply, I think the story continues to stink to high heaven. My speculation 
maybe the FBI swooped in after the locals, whoops, we screwed up and missed the deadlines and let the crime scene get bulldozed and have the local NBC guy rooting around through evidence just like in the San Bernardino case that we mentioned. And then the case gets thrown out on the local level just due to, you know, bureaucracy. Did the feds come get their patsies for a little like debrief session after some kind of black op gone wrong? I I think this seems like some kind of botched honeypot, false flag, agent provocateur, informant operation, and now they are trying to cover it all up once it all kind of broke and fell apart. James? Yes, this is one of those labyrinthine stories that is equal parts intriguing and fascinating and baffling and horrifying, and as you say, stinky, because there's clearly some sort of something going on. There's some sort of FBI operation at play here, and a uh, Again, who knows if we'll ever get to the actual bottom of this, or if maybe we will, but it'll be a few years later after the fact. At any rate, I uh, it's one of those stories that is uh, really interesting, but I have so much on my plate that I can't possibly be covering the ins and outs and details myself, which is why I'm glad that there are people like yourself out there covering these types of holy hex events on a regular, ongoing basis. That's why I'm tuned to the Media Monarchy feeds. But it's not all bad news all the time. Uh, James, tell us you've got some good news. I do indeed have a little bit of good news. I've got the latest episode of Good News next week. Really interesting story. Fighting fast fashion with clothing libraries. Another sort of idea like the community fridge or the tool library. I think, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's again... The sort of good news stories that are ideas that people can immediately implement, not about something that maybe happened or an event or a one-off occurrence. Again, it's all about the ideas. It's all about the mind viruses and the memes. So as always, the Good News Next Week episodes are actually available for Media Monarchy members only. And in other deprogramming news, I've got a new website in the works. Media Monarchy will be 13 years old next Tuesday on the 9-11 anniversary. And as I always like to mention, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. All right. Well, I'll be listening. I hope everyone else will, too. And uh, stay tuned to Corbett Report for some interesting stuff coming next week. But uh, uh, in the meantime and in between time, we'll talk to you uh, again very soon. All right, buddy. Thanks. <laughs>